next time. First talk for today is by Hannes Meenert. It will be it's titled Leaving Legacy Behind. It's about the reduction of carbon footprint through um, microkernels in the Mirage OS. Give a warm welcome to Hannes. Thank you. So let's talk a bit about legacy. So legacy we had have uh, nowadays we run services usually on a Unix based operating system, which is uh, demonstrated here on the left a bit, the layering. So at the lowest layer we have the hardware. So some physical CPU, some block devices, maybe a network interface card and maybe some memory, some non-persistent memory. On top of that, we usually run the Unix kernel, so to say, that is uh, marked here in brown, which, is, uh, which consists of a file system. Then it has a scheduler, it has some process management, it has a network stack, so a TCP IP stack. It also has some user management and hardware and drivers. So it has uh, drivers for the physical hard for, for the network interface and so on. The brown stuff, so the kernel runs in privilege mode. It um, <clears throat> exposes a system call API or a, and or a socket API to the actual application we are, <clears throat> we are there to run, which is here in orange. So the actual application is on top, which is the application binary. It may depend on some configuration files uh, distributed randomly across the file system with uh, some file permissions and so on. Then the application itself also depends likely on a program language runtime that may either be a Java virtual machine if you run Java or a Python interpreter if you run Python or a Ruby interpreter if you run Ruby and so on. Then additionally, we usually have a system library, libc, which is the runtime library basically of the C programming language and uh, it exposes a much nicer interface than the system calls. We as well may have uh, OpenSSL or another crypto library as part of the application binary, which is uh, also here in orange. So what's the job of the kernel? So the brown stuff uh, actually has a virtual memory subsystem and it should uh, separate the orange stuff from each other. So you have multiple applications running there and uh, the brown stuff is uh, responsible to ensure that the orange, uh, that the different pieces of orange uh, stuff don't interfere with each other so that they are not randomly writing into each other's memories and so on. Now if the orange stuff is uh, compromised, so if you have some attacker from the network or from wherever else who's able to uh, find, an <coughs> find a flaw in the orange uh, stuff, um, the kernel is still responsible for uh, strict uh, isolation between the orange stuff, so as long as the attacker only gets access to the orange stuff, it should be very well contained. But then we look at the bridge between the brown and the orange stuff, so between kernel and user space, and there we have an API which uh, is roughly 600 system calls, at least on my FreeBSD machine here <coughs> in syscall. So it's 600 different functions, or the, the width of this API is uh, 600 different functions, <coughs> which is quite big, and it's quite easy to hide some flaws in there. And as soon as you're able to uh, <coughs> find a flaw in any of those system calls, you can escalate your privileges. And then you basically run in the brown mode, so in kernel mode, and you have access to the raw physical hardware, and you can also read arbitrary memory from any process running there. <coughs> so now, over the years, it actually evolved, and we added uh, some more layers, which is uh, hypervisors. So at the lowest layer, we still have the hardware stack, but on top of the hardware, we now have a hypervisor, which is which uh, responsibility is to split the physical hardware into pieces and slice it up and run different virtual machines. So now we have uh, the white stuff, which is the hypervisor, and on, on top of that we have multiple brown things and multiple orange uh, things as well. So now the hypervisor is responsible for distributing the CPUs to virtual machines and 
the memory to virtual machines and so on. It is also responsible for selecting which virtual machine to run on which physical CPU, so it actually includes a scheduler as well. <clears throat> and the hypervisor's responsibility is, again, to isolate the different virtual machines from each other. Um, initially, hypervisors were done mostly in software. Nowadays, there are a lot of um, CPU features available, which allows you to have some CPU support, which makes them fast, and um, you don't have to trust uh, so much software anymore, but you have to trust then the hardware. So that's uh, extended page tables and VTD and VTX uh, stuff. Okay, so that's uh, the legacy we have uh, right now. So when you ship a binary, you actually uh, care about some tip of the iceberg. That is the code you actually write and you care about. You care about deeply because it should uh, work well <coughs> and you want to run it. But at the bottom, you have the sole operating system and that is the code the operating system insists uh, that you need it. So you can't get it without the bottom of the iceberg. So you will always have a process management and user management and likely as well the file system around on a Unix system. Then in addition, uh, back in May, I think there was uh, a uh, blog entry from someone who analyzed uh, from Google Project Zero, which is uh, a security research team, a red team, which tries to find a lot of uh, flaws in uh, widely used applications. And they, and they found in a year maybe 110 different uh, vulnerabilities, which they uh, reported and so on. And someone <clears throat> analyzed what are these 110 vulnerabilities about. And it turned out that more than two-thirds of them, that the root cause of the flaw was uh, memory corruption. A memory corruption means uh, arbitrary reads or writes from, from arbitrary memory, which a process is not supposed to be in. So why does that happen? That happens because um, we, on the Unix system, we mainly use um, program languages where we have tight control over the memory management. So we do it ourselves. So we allocate the memory ourselves and we free it ourselves. There is a lot of boilerplate we need to write down and that is also not a lot of boilerplate which you can get wrong. <clears throat> so now we talked a bit about legacy. Let's talk about the goals of this talk. The goals is on the one side to be more secure, so to reduce the attack vectors because um, C and uh, languages like that are from the 70s, and we may have some languages from the 80s or even from the 90s who offer you automated memory management and memory safety. Languages such as Java or Rust or Python or something like that. But it turns out not many people are writing operating systems in those languages. Another point here is I want to reduce the attack surface. So we have seen this uh, huge uh, stack here, and I want to minimize the orange and the brown part. <clears throat> then, uh, as an implication of that, I also want to reduce the runtime complexity, because it is actually pretty cumbersome to figure out what is now wrong, why does your application not start, and if the whole reason is because some file on your hard disk has the wrong file system permissions, that is pretty hard to, um, to get across if you're not, not yet a Unix expert who has lived in the system for years or at least months. And then the final goal, um, thanks to the topic of this conference and to some analysis I did, is to actually reduce the carbon footprint. So if you run a service, you Certainly, <clears throat> that service does some computation, and this computation takes uh, some CPU ticks. So it takes some CPU time in order to be evaluated. And now, reducing that means if we condense down the complexity and the code size, we also reduce the amount of computation which needs to be done. These are the goals. <clears throat> What is a Mirage as Unicorn? That is basically the project I've been involved in since uh, six years or so. The 
<clears throat> the general idea is that each service is isolated in a separate Mirage as Unicorn. So your DNS resolver or your web server don't run on this general purpose Unix system as a process, but you have a separate virtual machine for each of them. So you have one Unicornal which only does DNS resolution. And in that Unicornal, you don't even need a user management. You don't even need process management because there's only a single process. There's a DNS resolver. Actually, a DNS resolver also doesn't really need a file system, so we got rid of that. We also don't really need virtual memory because we only have one process, so we don't need virtual memory, and um, we just use a single address space. So everything is mapped uh, in a single address space. We use a, a program language called OCaml, which is a functional programming language, which provides us with memory safety, so it has automated memory management. And we use this um, memory management and the isolation which the uh, program manager guarantees us with <clears throat> by its type system. We use that to say, okay, yeah, we can all live in a single address space and it will still be safe as long as the components are safe and as long as we minimize the uh, components which are by definition unsafe. So if we need to run some C code there as well. So in addition, well, <clears throat> now if we have a single service, we only put in the libraries or the stuff we actually need in that service. So as I mentioned, the DNS resolver won't need a user management. It doesn't need a shell. Why would I need a shell? What should I need to do there? And so on. So <clears throat> we have a lot of libraries, a lot of OCaml libraries, which are uh, picked by the single service or which are mixed and matched uh, for the different services. So the libraries are developed independently of the whole system or of the unicornal and are reused across the different uh, components or across the different services. Um, some further limitation which I take as freedom and simplicity is uh, not even we have a single address space, we are also only focusing on single core and have a single process. So we don't have a process. We don't know the concept of process yet. Um, we also don't work in a preemptive um, way. So preemptive means that if you run on a CPU as a function or as a program, you can at any time be interrupted because something who's uh, much more important than you can now get access to the CPU. And we don't do that. We do cooperative tasks, so we are never interrupted. We don't even have interrupts, so there are no in <coughs> interrupts. And as I mentioned, it's executed as a virtual machine. So how does that look like? So now we have uh, the same picture as previously. We have at the bottom the hypervisor. Then we have the host system, which is the brownish uh, stuff. Then on top of that, we have um, maybe some virtual machines. Some of them run via KVM and QEMU uh, Unix system using some virt.io that is on the right and on the left. And in the middle, we have this Mirage S uh, Unicornals where we in the host system don't run any QMU, but we run a minimized uh, so-called tender, <coughs> which is this uh, Solo 5 HVT monitor process. So that's something which uh, just uh, tries to allocate or will allocate some host system resources for the virtual machine and then does uh, uh, interaction with the virtual machine. So what does Solo 5 HVT do in this case is to set up the memory, load the unikernel image, which is a statically linked ELF binary, and it sets up the virtual CPU. So the CPU needs some initialization, and then booting is uh, jumped to an address. It's already in 64-bit mode. There's no need to boot via 16 or 32-bit modes. <clears throat> now, Solo 5 HVT and the Mirage OS, they also have a an interface, and the interface is called Hypercalls, and that interface is rather small, so it only contains in total 14 different functions, which is uh, main function, uh, yield, uh, way to get the ar argument vector uh, clock, actually two clocks, one is a POSIX clock, which uh, takes care of this uh, whole time stamping and uh, time zone business, and another one is a monotonic clock, which by its name guarantees that time uh, will pass uh, monotonically. 
Then you have a console interface. The console interface um, is only one way, so we only output data. We never read from console. Um, a block device, well, block devices and network interfaces. And that's all the hypercalls we have. To look a bit further down into detail of how Mirage OS uh, Unicorn looks like, it, um, here I pictured on the left again the tender at the bottom and then the hypercalls, and then in pink I have the um, pieces of code which still contain some C code in a Mirage OS Unicorn. And in green I have the pieces of code which does, uh, which do not include any C code, but only OCaml code. So looking at the C code, which is dangerous, because in C we have to deal with memory management on our own, which means it's a bit brittle. We need to carefully review that code. It is definitely the OCaml runtime which we have here, which is around 25,000 lines of code. Uh, then we have a library which is uh, called uh, nolibc. It is basically a C library which implements malloc and string compare and some basic functions which are needed by the OCaml runtime. That's roughly 8,000 lines of code. Um, that nolibc also provides a lot of uh, stops which just exit or return null for the OCaml runtime because we need, well, we use an unmodified OCaml runtime to be able to um, upgrade our software more easily. We don't have any patches for the OCaml runtime. Then we have a library called Solo5 Bindings, which is basically something which uh, translates into hypercalls or which can access the hypercalls and which uh, communicates with the host system via hypercalls. That is roughly 2,000 lines of code. Then we have a math library for sinus and cosinus and tangents and so on, and that is uh, just the open libm, which is uh, from the, originally from the FreeBC project and roughly 20,000 lines of code. So that's it. So I talked a bit about uh, Solo5, about the bottom layer, and I will go a bit more into detail about the Solo5 stuff, which is really the stuff you run <coughs> Uh, well, which is um, you, you run at the bottom of Mirage OS. There's another choice. You can also run Xen or Cubes OS at the bottom of a Mirage OS Unicorn, but I'm focusing here mainly on Solo 5. So Solo 5 is a sandbox execution environment for Unicornals. It handles resources from the host system, but only statically. So you say at startup time, how much memory it will take, how many network interfaces and which ones are taken, and how many block devices and which ones are taken by the virtual machine. You don't have any dynamic resource management, so you can't add at a uh, later point in time at a new network interface. That's uh, just not uh, supported. Then, <clears throat> and it makes the code much easier. Uh, we don't even have dynamic um, allocation inside of Sol 5. Then we have a, a hypercall interface. As I mentioned, it's only 14 functions. We have um, bindings for different targets. So we can run on KVM, which is a uh, hypervisor developed for the Linux uh, project, but also for Beehive, which is a FreeBSD hypervisor, or VMM, which is an OpenB OpenBSD hypervisor. We also target other systems, such as Gnode, which is an operating system based on a microkernel written mainly in C++. Uh, Vert.io, which is a protocol usually spoken between the host system and the guest system. And Vert.io is used in, um, in a lot of cloud deployments, so it's okay. So QAMO, for example, provides you with a Vert.io um, protocol implementation. Um, and the last uh, implementation of uh, Solo 5 or bindings for Solo 5 is uh, SecComp. So Linux SecComp is a uh, filter in the uh, Linux kernel where you can restrict your process that it will only use a certain uh, number or a certain, um, a certain uh, amount of uh, system calls. And we use uh, SecCom, so you can deploy it without a virtual machine in the SecCom case, but you are restricted to which uh, system calls you, you can use. 
So Solo 5 also provides you with the uh, host system tender where applicable. So in the virt.io case, it is not applicable. In the gnode case, it is also not applicable. In KVM, we already saw the Solo 5 HVT, that is a hardware virtualized tender, um, which is yeah just a small binary because if you run few emu, it's um, yeah at least hundreds of thousands of lines of code in the. Um, Solo 5 HVT case, it's more like thousands of lines of code. Um, so here we have a comparison from left to right of uh, Solo 5 and how the host system or the host system kernel and the guest system works. In the middle, we have a virtual machine, so a common Linux, QEMU, KVM based virtual machine, for example. And on the right, and we have the host system and the container. Container is also a technology where you try to restrict as much as much access as you can from a process. So it is contained and the potential compromise is also very isolated and contained. So on the left hand side we see the Solo 5 is basically some bits and pieces are in the host system, so the Solo 5 HVD, and then some bits and pieces are in the unicorn. So that is the Solo 5 bindings I mentioned earlier, and that is to communicate between the host and the guest system. In the middle we see that the uh, API between the host system and the virtual machine, it's much, it's much bigger, that is commonly using virt.io, and virt.io is really a huge protocol which does feature negotiation and all sorts of things where you can always do something wrong, like you can <clears throat> do something wrong in the floppy disk driver and that led to some exploitable vulnerability, although nowadays most operating systems don't really need a floppy disk drive anymore. And on the right hand side you can see that the host system interface for a container is much bigger than for a virtual machine because the host system interface for a container is exactly those system calls you saw earlier. So it's around 600 different calls. And in order to uh, evaluate the security you need basically to audit all of them. <clears throat> so that's just a brief uh, comparison between those. If we look into more detail what Solo 5, what shapes it can have, here on the left side we can see it running in a hardware virtualized tender, which is you have the Linux, FreeBSD or OpenBSD at the bottom, and you have a, a Solo 5 blob, which is a blue thing <coughs> here in the middle, and then on top you have the Unicorn. On the right hand side you, can, you see the Linux uh, second process, and you have a much uh, smaller Solo 5 blob. Uh, because it doesn't need to do that much anymore because all the hyper calls are basically translated to system calls so you actually get rid of them and you don't need to communicate between the host and the guest system because in seccomp you run as a host system process so you don't have this virtualization. The advantage of using uh, seccomp is as well that you can deploy it without having access to virtualization features of the CPU. Now to um, get it in even smaller shape, there's another backend I haven't talked to you about. It's called the MUEN. It's a separation kernel developed in ADA. So you basically, so now we try to get rid of this huge um, <coughs> Unix system below it, which is this big uh, kernel thingy here. And MUEN is um, an open source project developed in Switzerland in ADA, as I mentioned and it uses Spark, which is a, a, a proof system which um, guarantees then memory isolation between the different components. And Muen now goes a step further and it says, oh yeah, well you as a guest system, you don't do static allocations and uh, you don't do dynamic resource management. We as a host system, we as a hypervisor, we don't do any dynamic resource allocation as well. So it only does static resource management. So at compile time of your MUEN separation kernel, you decide how many virtual machines or how many unikernels you are running and which resources are given to them. You even specify which communication channels are there. So if one of your virtual machines needs to talk to another one, you need to specify that at, uh, uh, at uh, compile time. And at runtime, you don't have any dynamic resource management. So that 
again, makes the code much easier, much, much less complex, and you <clears throat> get to uh, much fewer lines of code. Um, so to conclude with this Mirage and um, how this, and also Muen and Solo 5, and how that is, I like to cite uh, Antoine about perfection is achieved, not when there's nothing more to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. <clears throat> I mean, obviously the most secure system is a system which doesn't exist. Um, Let's look a bit uh, further into the decisions of Mirage OS on why do you use this strange programming language called OCaml and what's it all about and what are the case studies. So OCaml has been around since um, more than 20 years. It's a multi-paradigm programming language. Um, the goal for us and for OCaml is usually to have declarative code. To achieve declarative code, you need to um, provide the developers with uh, some orthogonal abstraction facilities, such as here we have variables and functions you likely know if you're a software developer. Also higher order functions, so that just means that a function is able to take a function as input. Then in OCaml we try to always focus on the problem and do not distract with boilerplate. So, some running example again would be this memory management. We don't manually deal with that, but we have computers who actually deal with that. In OCaml, you have a very expressive and static type system, which can spot a lot of invariants uh, or violation of invariants at build time. So the program won't compile if you don't um, handle all the potential uh, return types or return values of your function. So now a type system, you know, you may know it from Java is a bit painful if you have to express at every location where you want to have a variable which type this variable is. Um, what OCaml provides is type inference similar to Scala and other languages, so you don't need to type all the types uh, manually. And types are also, unlike in Java, <coughs> types are erased during compilation, so types are only information about values the compiler has at compile time, but at runtime these are all erased, so they don't exist, you don't see them. And OCaml compiles to native uh, machine code, which I think is important for uh, security and performance, um, because otherwise you run an interpreter or an abstract machine and you have to emulate something else, and that is uh, never as fast as you can. OCaml has uh, one distinct feature, which is its module system. So you have all your values, which are types or functions, and now each of those values is defined inside of a so-called module, and the simple module is just a file name. But you can nest modules so you can explicitly say, oh yeah, this uh, value or this binding is now living in a sub-module here of. So each module, you can also give it a type, so it has a set of uh, types and a set of functions, and that is called its uh, signature which is the interface of the module. Now you have a, another abstraction mechanism in OCaml, which is uh, functors. And functors are basically compile time functions from module to module. So they allow parameterization, like you can implement your generic map structure and all you require. So map is just a hash map where you, or a map, a, Implementation is maybe a binary tree and you, all you need to have is uh, some comparison for the keys. And that is modeled in OCaml by a module. So you have a module called map and you have a functor called make and the make takes some module which implements this comparison method and then provides you with a, a map data structure for that key type. And then Mirato, as we actually use the module system quite a bit more because we have all these resources which are different between Xen and KVM and so on. So each of the different resources, like a network interface, has a signature. 
okay? And the target specific implementation. So we have, so the TCP IP stack, which is much higher than the network card, it doesn't really care if you run on Xen or if you run on KVM. You just program against this abstract interface, against the interface of the network device. But you don't need to program, you don't need to write in your TCP IP stack any code to run on Xen or to run on KVM. <clears throat> So Mirato has also doesn't really use the complete uh, OCaml programming language. OCaml also provides you with an object system and we barely use that. We also in Mirato as well, OCaml also allows you for with a mutable state and we barely use that mut uh, uh, mutable state but we use uh, mostly immutable data whenever sensible. We also have a value passing style, so we put state and data as input. So state is just some abstract state and data is just a byte vector in a protocol implementation. And then the output is also a new state, which may be modified, and some reply maybe, so some other byte vector or some application data. <clears throat> or the output may, may as well be an error because the incoming data and state may be invalid or may, may violate some, some constraints. <clears throat> and errors are also explicitly types, so they are declared in the API and the caller of a function needs to handle all these um, errors uh, explicitly. As I said, uh, single core, but we have uh, some promise-based or some event-based uh, concurrent programming stuff. And yeah, we have the ability to express really strong invariants like this is a read-only buffer in the type system. And the type system is, as I mentioned, only compile time, no runtime overhead. So it's all pretty nice and uh, good. So let's uh, take a look at some of the case studies. Uh, the first one is uh, Unikernel, so it's called the Bitcoin Piñata. It started in 2015 when we were happy with the uh, from scratch developed TLS stack. TLS is transport layer security, so what you use if you browse to HTTPS. So we have a TLS stack in OCaml and we wanted to do some uh, marketing for that. Um, Bitcoin Piñata is basically a unikernel which uses TLS and provides you with uh, TLS endpoints and it contains the private key for a Bitcoin wallet which is filled with, uh, which used to be filled with uh, 10 bitcoins. And this means it's a security bait, so if you can compromise the system itself, you get the private key and you can do whatever you want with it. And being on this bitcoin blockchain, it also means it's uh, transparent, so everyone can see whether it has been hacked or not. Yeah, and it has been online since uh, three years and it was not hacked, but the Bitcoin we got were only borrowed from uh, friends of us and they were then reused in other projects. It's still online and you can see here on the right that we had some HTTP traffic like uh, an aggregate of maybe 600,000 uh, hits there. Now I have a size comparison of the Bitcoin piñata on the left. You can see the unikernel, which is less than uh, 10 megabytes in size, or in source code, it's maybe 100,000 lines of code. And on the right-hand side, you have a very similar thing, but running as a Linux service. So it runs an OpenSSLS server, which is a minimal, um, H, uh, the minimal TLS server you can get basically on, on a Linux system using OpenSSL. And there we have mainly uh, maybe a size of 200 megabytes and maybe um, 2 million lines of code. So that's roughly a uh, factor of 25. In other examples, we even got a bit less code, a uh, much bigger factor. Performance analysis, I yeah, showed, uh, well, also in 2015, we did some evaluation of our TLS stack, and it turns out we are in the same ballpark as uh, other implementations. Another case study is a Kaldaf server, which we developed uh, last year 
uh, with a grant from Prototype Fund, which is a German government's uh, funding. It is interoperable with other clients. Um, it stores data in a remote Git repository, so we don't use any block device or persistent storage, but we store it in a Git repository, so whenever you add the calendar event, it does actually a Git push. And yeah, we also recently got some integration with Caldav Zeb, which is a JavaScript user interface doing a, in JavaScript, uh, doing a user interface, and we just bundled that with the thing. Uh, it's online, open source, there's a demo server and the data repository online. Yes, uh, some statistics, and I zoom in directly to the CPU usage. So we had the luck that we, for half of a month, we used it as a process on a, a FreeBSD system, and that happened roughly the first half until here. And then at some point we thought, oh yeah, let's uh, migrate it to a Mirage as Unicornal and don't run the FreeBSD system below it. And you can see here on the x-axis the time, so that is the month of June, starting with the 1st of June on the left and the last of June on the right. And on the y-axis you have the number of CPU seconds here on the left or the number of CPU ticks here on the right. The CPU ticks are virtual CPU ticks, which are debug counters from the uh, hypervisors, so from Beehive and FreeBSD here in that system. And what you can see here is this massive drop by a factor of roughly 10, and that is when we switched from a Unix virtual machine with a process to a freestanding Unicorn. So we actually use much less resources. And if we look into the bigger picture here, we also see that the memory dropped by a factor of uh, 10, or even more, this is now logarithmic scale here on the y-axis. The network bandwidth increased quite a bit because now we do all the monitoring traffic also via network interface and so on. Okay, that's Kaldav. Another <clears throat> case study is authoritative DNS servers. Um, and I just recently wrote a tutorial on that. I will uh, skip because I'm a bit short on time. Another case study is uh, Firewall for CubeOS. So CubeOS is a reasonable secure operating system which uses Xen for isolation of workspaces and applications, such as PDF reader. So whenever you receive a PDF, you start your virtual machine, which is uh, only run once, and you, uh, well, which is just run to open and read your PDF. And Cube's Mirage Firewall is now a small or a tiny replacement for the Linux-based firewall written in OCaml now. And instead of roughly 300 megabytes, you only use 32 megabytes of uh, memory. There's uh, now also recently some uh, support for dynamic firewall rules uh, as defined by Cubes 4.0. That is uh, not yet merged into master, but it's uh, under review. Uh, libraries in Mirage OS, yeah, we have, uh, since we write everything from scratch and in OCaml, we don't have now, we, we don't have every protocol, but we have quite a few protocols. There are also more Unicornals uh, right now, which you can see here, and the slides are also online in the uh, far plan, so you can click on the links later. Reputers were built, so for security purposes, we don't yet ship binaries, but I plan to ship binaries, and in order to ship binaries, I don't want to ship non-reproducible binaries. What is reproducible builds? Well, it means that if you have the same source code, you should get the binary identical output. And issues are temporary file names and timestamps and so on. In December, we managed in <clears throat> Mirage OS to get some tooling on track to actually test the reproducibility of Unicornals, and we fixed some issues, and now all the tested Mirage OS Unicornals are reproducible, which are basically most of them from this list. Another topic is supply chain security, which is uh, important, I think, and uh, we have uh, this is still work in progress. We uh, still haven't deployed that widely, but there are some test uh, repositories out there to provide more, to provide signatures signed by the actual author of a library. 
and uh, getting across until the user of the library can verify that and uh, some decentralized uh, authorization and delegation of that. What about deployment? Well, <clears throat> in conventional orchestration systems such as Kubernetes and so on, uh, we don't yet have a proper integration of Mirage OS. Um, but we would like to get some proper integration there. <clears throat> we already generate some libvirt.xml files from uh, Mirage. So for each unicorn, you get the libvirt.xml, and you can do that and run that in your libvirt-based uh, orchestration system. For Xen, we also generate those .xl and .xe files, which I personally don't really know much about, but that's it. On the other side, I um, <clears throat> de developed an orchestration system called Albatross because I was a bit wary if I now have those tiny unikernels, which are megabytes in size, and now I should trust the big Kubernetes, which is maybe a million lines of code running on the host system with privileges. So I thought, oh, well, let's uh, try to come up with a minimal orchestration system which allows me some console access, so I want to see the debug messages, or whenever it fails to boot, I want to see the, the output of, it, uh, of the console. want to get some metrics, like the Grafana screenshot you just saw, and that's basically it. Then, since I developed also a TLS stack, I thought, oh yeah, well, <clears throat> why not just use it for remote deployment? So in TLS, you have mutual authentication, you can have client certificates, and the certificate it itself is more or less an authenticated key value store because you have those extensions in X509 version 3 and you can put arbitrary data in there with uh, keys being so-called object identifiers and values being whatever else. TLS certificates have this uh, great advantage that or X509 certificates have the advantage that during a TLS handshake, they are transferred on the wire in not base 64 or PEM encoding as you usually see them, but in, um, in, in basic encoding, which is um, much uh, nicer to, to the amount of bits you, you transfer. So it's not uh, transferred in base 64, but directly in raw, basically. And with Albatross, you can basically do a TLS handshake, and in that client certificate you present, you already have the unicorn image and the name and the boot arguments, and you just deploy it directly. Um, you can also, in X509, you have a chain of uh, certificate authorities, which you send with, and this uh, chain of certificate authorities also contains some extensions in order to specify which policies are active. So how many virtual machines are you able to deploy on my system, how much memory you, you have access to, and which bridges or which network interfaces you have access to. So Albatross is really a minimal orchestration system running as a family of Unix processes. It's maybe 3,000 lines of code or so, or camel code, uh, but using then TLS stack and so on. But it's, yeah. It seems to work pretty well. I at least use it for uh, more than two dozen unicorns uh, at any <clears throat> point in time. What about the community? Well, the whole Mirage OS project started around 2008 at University of Cambridge. So it used to be a research project, with, uh, which uh, still has a lot of ongoing student projects at the University of Cambridge. But now it's um, an open source, permissively licensed, mostly BSD licensed um, thing, where we have community events every half a year in uh, a retreat in Morocco, where we also use our own unicorns like the DHCP server and the DNS resolver and so on. We just use them to test them and to see oh, how does it behave and does it work for us. We have uh, quite a lot of open source computer, uh, contributors from all over. And uh, some of the Mirage OS libraries have also been used or are still used in this uh, Docker technology, Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows, which emulates 
the gas system or we need some wrappers and there are a lot of OCaml code is uh, used. So to <coughs> uh, finish my talk, I would uh, like to have another side, which is that Rome wasn't built in a day. So where we are is to conclude here, we have a radical approach to operating systems development. We have a security from the ground up with uh, much fewer code. And um, we also have much fewer attack vectors because we, are, we, we use a memory safe language. So um, We have a reduced uh, carbon footprint, as I mentioned in the start of the talk, because we use much less CPU time, but also much less memory, so we use less resources. It, uh, Mirato as itself and OCaml has a reasonable performance. We have seen some statistics about the TLS stack that it was in the same ballpark as OpenSSL and Polar SSL, which is nowadays uh, embed TLS. And uh, Mirato Unicornals, since they don't really need to negotiate features and wait for the SCSI bus and so on, they actually boot in milliseconds, not in seconds. So they do not hardware probing and so on, but they know at uh, startup time, what they expect. I would like to thank everybody who's, uh, who is and was involved in the solar technology stack, because I myself, I program quite a bit of OCaml, but I wouldn't have been able to do that uh, on my own. It is uh, just a bit too big. Mirage has currently spans around maybe 200 different Git repositories with uh, the libraries mostly developed on, on GitHub and open source. I'm at the moment working uh, on a non-profit company in Germany, which is called the Center for the Cultivation of Technology, with a project called Robur. So we work in a collective way to develop full stack Mirage as Unicornals. That's, I'm happy to do that from Berlin, and if you're interested, please talk to us. I've uh, some selected uh, related talks. There are much more talks about uh, Mirafes, but here's just a short list of something. If you're interested in some certain aspects, uh, please help yourself to view them. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a bit over 10 minutes uh, of time for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, walk to the microphone. There's several one, ones around the room. Uh, go ahead and ask Thank you away. very much for the talk. Uh, oh, how does by the way, word of order. Thanking the speaker can be done afterwards, and questions are questions, so short sentences ending with a question mark. But sorry, do go ahead. If I want to try this at home, what do I need? Is a RASP sufficient? No, it isn't. That is an excellent question. So I usually develop it on uh, such a ThinkPad uh, machine, but we actually support also uh, ARM64 mode. So if you have a Raspberry Pi 3 Plus, which I think has the virtualization bits, and the Linux kernel, which is reason enough to support KVM on that Raspberry Pi 3 Plus, then you can try it out there. OK, next question. Well, uh, currently, most Mirage OS unikernels are used uh, for running server, yeah, server applications. Uh, and so, uh, obviously, with all this static pre-configuration uh, of OCaml and maybe Ada Spark is fine for that. But uh, what do you think about, uh, will it ever be possible uh, to use the same approach with all this uh, yeah, static pre-configuration for these very dynamic end-user desktop systems, for example, like uh, which uh, at least currently uh, use quite a lot of plug and play. Do you have an example? What you are thinking about? Well, uh, uh, I'm I'm not that much uh, into the topic of uh, Eight Spark uh, stuff, but uh, you said that all the communications paths have to be uh, defined in advance. So especially with uh, plug and play devices like all this USB stuff. Uh, we either have to allow everything in, in advance, or we yeah, may have to reboot parts of uh, uni parts of uni kernels uh, in between to allow yeah rerouting stuff. 
That's yes. how I would understand it. Yes. And so, I mean, if you want to design a USB plug-and-play system, you can think of it as uh, you plug in somewhere the USB stick and then you start a unikernel which only has access to that USB stick. But having a unikernel, well, I, I wouldn't design a unikernel which has, uh, which randomly does plug-and-play with uh, the, the outer world, basically. So, and uh, one of the applications I've listed here is uh, at the top is a picture viewer, which is um, a unikernel that also at the moment I think has it as uh, static embedded data in it, but it is able on CubeOS or on Unix and SDL to display the images. And you can think of some way via network or so to access the images actually. So you don't need to compile the images in, but you can have a Git repository or a TCP server or whatever in order to receive the images. Okay. So I, I'm saying, so what I didn't mention is that Mirasha is instead of being general purpose and having a shell and you can do everything with it, it is that each service, each unikernel is a single service uh, thing, so you can't do everything with it. And I think that is an advantage from a lot of points of view. I agree that um, if you have a highly dynamic system that you may have some trouble on how to integrate that. Are there any other questions? Well, it appears not. In which case, uh, thank you again, Hannes. Warm applause for Hannes.